I suppose my earliest influences were just gardening at home. It was sort of wartime and, you know, Dad did the vegetables and Mum did the flower garden and I was paid so much a bucket full of weeds. <laughs> and that got me interested, believe it or not. I actually wanted to go into farming. It's I've always had, as I uh, mentioned earlier, this connection to the countryside and I love livestock within it and I wanted to be a farmer I had a godfather who was a farmer uh, and I spent a lot of time with him and uh, my father pointed out very early on that you know I can't afford to buy your farm and I don't know why it was never mentioned I could become a farm manager or I didn't get to know about sort of forestry and all sorts of exciting things like that. I experienced different landscapes when I did my national service and I I was in Wiltshire a lot, my home being in Durham and Northumberland and I just suddenly discovered new landscapes in Wiltshire and the Wiltshire Downs and things which I used to walk a lot in and this sort of fostered my interest in different land patterns and how the land is used and how it's farmed. Um, and when my National Service was finished, I did a, a year's course in commercial horticulture, uh, learning how to grow tomatoes, I suppose, basically. But actually, there was a, it was in a, my county agricultural school, so I was working with other agricultural students um, but learning a lot about the soil and a lot of good sort of basic stuff. But after that, what did I do? Actually, I won a scholarship to uh, do a BSc in horticulture at, at Reading University. I didn't want to do a BSc in horticulture. I wanted to study landscape design. And there was a course at Reading, but they wouldn't allow me to swap the scholarship over. Much to my parents' chagrin, I'm quite sure. So I eventually opted for uh, doing a three-year apprenticeship with a parks department. At that stage, landscape architecture garden design were not really considered as professions yet in this country. Development uh, was of new towns, uh, of power stations, of new roads, but actually the, the smaller sort of domestic side of things hadn't yet come into its own. And that's really what interested me. Uh, and by working uh, with a parks department, I continued my sort of horticultural training, but actually the last six months was in the office of a, a Dutch landscape architect who was working. And I really thought, wow, yes, this is it. And I liked it enormously. And I sent my drawings to an old landscape architect in London, Brenda Corbin, and said, can I come and work for you? Uh, and eventually, I did go and work in her office. Should, should I continue in, continue the saga? Yes, definitely, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Brenda Corvin uh, retired eventually and went to the country and I did a, uh, a course in landscape architecture at University College London under Peter Youngman uh, and then I went back to the same office which Brenda Corvin had shared with Sylvia Crowe and I worked with her for a number of years um, with Michael Laurie and Anthony de Gard Pasley who were in the office at the same time. Uh, she was doing uh, housing for American forces in England. She was doing power stations. She was doing new town work. Uh, and I still had this hankering to do smaller scale stuff. I loathed this sort of committee procedure that went on and on and on. And uh, I eventually took a side step. I spoke, I worked quite a lot with Susan and Jeffrey Jellicoe uh, at the time. 
with, and with Susan, we edited the journal of the Institute of Landscape Architects, and I knew Jeffrey, as her husband, socially, and they were very kind. They used to take me to the opera, and we used to go looking at gardens and things at the weekend. And for the first time, I went to a house that had Picassos on the wall, and I begin to uh, talk with Jeffrey about uh, art, which had always interested me, but really I had found nobody to talk to about it. And eventually I applied for a job on a monthly architectural magazine called Architectural Design, uh, just to get out of this rather straight jacket that I was beginning to find uh, landscape in, in Sylvia's office to be. Uh, and I was taken on by um, Monica Pigeon and Theo Crosby to redraw the architect's plans as they came into the office, i.e. reducing them, in fact. Um, which got me looking at architecture very closely. Uh, we also had an arts page and various amazing people came through the office who only in retrospect um, meant anything to me. People like Buckminster Fuller and Richard Hamilton. Um, we used to work until uh, eight o'clock at night. We started at, at lunchtime and worked through to the evening. So there was always this last hour period where the drinks cabinet was open and one had lovely conversations with these sort of people, me hovering about on the outside. Uh, there was a secretary as well, so there were only four of us. And eventually I got into a bit of page layout and doing captions and uh, eventually they allowed me to do a little landscape column at the back, by which time I think I had started doing a bit of teaching. Uh, so I was allowed one afternoon off a week. And then I think Q said, would I do a whole day with their diploma students? Uh, and Monica was getting a bit twitchy about this. And eventually I had a, enough work which I could build up in the morning to go into private practice. Uh, and with the teaching, uh, you know, I could make ends meet. So I gave up this extremely valuable experience I'd had on the magazine and went on my own and really have been so ever since. But never putting my eggs entirely in one basket. There's always been a bit of writing, a bit of uh, design work and some working with students as well.